Welcome. I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator. I, I read that to myself every month. I have to remind myself of my name. But thank you all for coming. And um, first, I'd like to invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk. We also have a couple of hosters with this year's Complete Lunch Poems program, so be sure to pick one up. Also on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can view this reading and past readings on our YouTube channel, um, which is really cool. We have our own channel, so tune into poetry. Uh, next month, March 2nd, we will welcome the poet Jennifer Clarvo. So do please come back and join us. Um, and now, welcome uh, director and English professor Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce today's esteemed guest, Forrest Gander. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. And I do want to re-echo um, thanking you all for being here and for this purpose. Um, this is the kind of speech that doesn't even need to be protested. Um, I'm reminded of a W.C. Williams quote, um, poetry is the rival government in opposition to its cruder replicas. Um, and I'm really happy to have a representative of that government here today in Forrest Gander, who, um, in addition to his work, about which I'll speak in a second, has done so much work around his work for poetry, and I think is a really crucial coordinate in a US poetry ecology and in a global ecology. Uh, he's a translator of um, Yoshimasu Gozo, of Jaime Sainz, of Pura Colom Lopez Colome, and many others. Tons of translation work. He's, of course, utterly essential to one of the best MFA programs in the country at Brown. Um, he just really makes poetry's life continue. Um, and I think that's present in his work from its very beginnings until now as well. He's always been a poet of the body and of the senses that that body organizes and of this, the space, the thin space between two bodies where senses can take place. And it's very clear in his work that that's not just an erotics, that's not just a sensuousness, that that's a space that's political and ethical as well. It's a space of regard um, and acknowledgement of many different kinds of other. I want to read one short poem from a chapbook of his about um, a Japanese dance partnership, Aiko and Koma, um, which is all about the negotiation of one body by another and the negative spaces that are made by those two bodies in conjunction. And I think we can hear in it everything that Forrest has cared about for his entire writing career and probably outside that writing career as well in the rest of his life and the life of the body. It's called Road Entering. Nothing but in care of, advanced, with her eyelids, drawn, his steps unchalked, the back-thrown throat, nothing but in care of thee, so dedicated to closeness, in the singed nothing, against what must ensue, black-brushed with hair, even in dream, advanced, ravened with a feather, into this terminal tempest, what must ensue, who have exchanged eyes. That initial nothing but, which then unfolds into nothing but in care of thee, which is Prospero speaking to his daughter Miranda from the Tempest, is exactly that negative space between bodies that can be filled with care and with ethical regard. The nothing but turning into a space of care for thee. And I think that's what we're about to hear much of. So I welcome Forrest Gander. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Thanks, Giovanni. Hi, Meryl, and um, my friends. So um, I'm, just, I'm gonna read for 25 minutes, um, and then I'm gonna sing for another 25. Um, the thing is, I don't have a watch that's working. Do you, you don't either? Is there a clock in here? Uh, yeah, I'd really love one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I, um, 
Thought I'd uh, read m mostly translations. I haven't been um, been writing much this year, and finish with a with a couple of, of poems of, of mine. And I thought I'd start with a Spanish poet that I've translated, who was born in 1931. So during uh, he's. He doesn't get to go to school because the Spanish Civil War is going on. And he, he claims to have learned uh, to read um, at home um, by, um, by working with his father's books of poetry. And he writes, he publishes his first book in 1960, and um, he's living under a fascist regime. And he decides not to publish again, sort of like George Oppen for almost 20 years. And when he does, uh, he comes to write this. His name is Antonio Gamaneda. Um, he's a winner of the Reina Sofia Prize. He's, he's still living. Ira, rage. From the violent drizzle, from places where residues of torments and sobs mesh comes this arterial grief, this shredded memory. They drive insane, even the mothers insane who course through my veins. The tortured shadows approach the signs. I think about the day when horses learn to weep. They come with lanterns lugging blind snakes to the albescent sand. There's a blaze of bells. Steel can be heard groaning in the city walled by wailing. They scream before calcined walls. They note the silhouette of knives, see the sun circle, the surgery of the animal stuffed with shadow. They hiss into white fistulas. There was an extraction of men. I saw the root living on the omen. I saw insects sucking up tears, saw blood splashed on yellow churches. There were scorched flowers and denim draped over oak weeping machine, oil and wailing in the steel, and propellers and bloody numbers in the purity of my rage. I recognized the tenanted shrouds and the spark plugs of pain, orations boiled up between the lips of shivering women. It was mortal music, the shriek of incessant horses. It was a funeral pavane at the hour of the bloodied cotton ball. It was the drooping of thousands of heads, the gargoyle, its maternal howl, the circles of the tormented hen. It's even once again the whitewash, the bone cold in our hands, the policeman's black marrow. I saw bodies along the edge of the cold acequias, shrouded in light. I saw the ropes and cords, saw the metallic seed in the briars, white with spines and light, and purpled, gobbling up the insects. I found mercury in my pupils, tears in the lumber, light at the wall of the dying. Beneath the busyness of ants, there were eyelids, and there was toxic water in the gutters. Even in my heart, there are ants. It's going to dawn over the prisons and tombs. The tortured head eyes me. Its ivory blazes like caught lightning. And I had the opportunity to, which I didn't consider an opportunity at first, um, since I had said in print several times that I, th I thought the last thing we needed was another Neruda translation. <laughs> and then um, three years ago, uh, his, um, Matilda Rutia, his last wife and the director of the Neruda Foundation started going through all these boxes of Neruda's uh, materials and finding things that no one had seen before, that no one had noticed before. And, um, and they published uh, a series of these um, poems in, um, in Latin America and Spain. And I thought it would be terrible. I thought they were just squeezing the last juices out of Neruda until I read the reviews. And um, they were good. And then I read the poems. and. Um, and I, when, when I was offered the opportunity to translate them, I knew I wanted to. This is Neruda 
uh, writing later about, as, as you know, he grows up in, uh, in the country, and at the age of 17, he comes to Santiago to cut his teeth with the big poets. And um, he gets into town, and there are manifestaciones, there are protests going on. Um, and uh, the police are riding through the protests, um, and the, the, the workers who are protesting, and, um, and clobbering people with batons on horseback um, in, in multitudes. And that's how Neruda entered Santiago and became Neruda. So this is a poem dated in the morning, April 25th, 1961. And Neruda's thinking back to um, 1921, 40 years earlier. I rolled beneath hooves. The horses passed over me like cyclones. The moment clutched its flags, and riding the student fervor, it blew into Chile. Sand and blood from the niter quarries, coal from back-breaking mines, copper extracted into the snow with our blood. And so the map was changing. The pastoral nation bristled into a forest of fists and horses. And before I turned 20, I received, amid the blows of police cudgels, the throbbing of a vast subterranean heart. And in safeguarding others, I understood their lives were my own. And I came by friends who will defend me to the last, because my poetry barely even shucked received the honor of their agonies. I'll just read one more from this collection, which is called. Yeah, I would have to grab the book over there. Um, but I can do that. So uh, Neruda is writing this poem at the time of the, uh, of the space race. Um, and he actually has the hots for a Russian cosmonaut. Um, but this is, uh, so this is the beginning of that time of imagining um, actually being off the world in interplanetary space. Estos dos hombres solos, estos primero hombres allá arriba que llevaron consigo de nosotros, de nosotros los hombres de la tierra. Se me ocurre que aquella luz fue nueva, aquella estrella aguda que viajaba, que tocaba y cortaba las distancias, aquellos rostros nuevos en la gran soledad, en el espacio puro, entre los astros finos y mojados, como la hierba en el amanecer, algo nuevo venía de la tierra. Those two solitary men, those first men up there, what of ours did they bring with them? What from us, the men of Earth? It occurs to me that the light was fresh then, that an unwinking star journeyed along, cutting short and linking distances, their faces unused to the awesome desolation in pure space, among astral bodies polished and glistening like grass at dawn. Something new came from the Earth, a wedding dress behind the two spaceships. It was our spring on Earth, blooming for the first time that conquered an inanimate heaven, depositing in those altitudes the seed of our kind. Hmm. You know what? There's lines missing in that. In the in the this is this is the whole poem. Oh, I didn't see that before. <clears throat> it occurs to me that the light was fresh then, that an unwinking star journeyed along, cutting short and linking distances, their faces unused to the awesome desolation in pure space among astral bodies polished and glistening like grass at dawn. 
Something new came from the earth, wings or bone coldness, enormous drops of water or surprise, thoughts, a strange bird throbbing to the distant human heart. And not only that, but cities, smoke, the roar of crowds, bells and violins, the feet of children leaving school. All of that is alive in space now, from now on, because the astronauts didn't go by themselves. They brought our earth, the odors of moss and forest, love, the crisscrossed limbs of men and women, terrestrial rains over the prairies, something floated up like a wedding dress behind the two spaceships. It was our spring on earth, blooming for the first time, that conquered an inanimate heaven, depositing in those altitudes the seed of our kind. I think that page is actually in there, and I just screwed up reading. I turned it. And um, um, these are, uh, this, this is a poem of mine, though it, it is actually, it's, it starts um, from a poem of San Juan de Yepes, who's uh, St. John of the Cross, but he wouldn't recognize it. In the beginning, the word was as being, in happiness, infinitely the word possessed. The same word being was, said to be beginning, beginninglessly. It went on, its voice a fervid world, for the word from the outset always was conceiving, concentrating its consequence for glory in the word possessed the being and all of beings going. It gleaned in the word, lover in beloved in, the other one went on, and that love which entwined them was of the same substance, two voices, one beloved among two, and in them each one happiness rendered them, one lover, in whose substance they gleamed as two possess one being, each alone possessed it, each of them in love, a plenum of the word, whose being each one twined around the other, beyond comprehension, an ineffable knot. Such fervid love entwined the two together, in one voice both possessed, a plenum of the world. The more that love was one, the more of love there was. Stone. And this, this started when uh, another poet uh, sent me a, a mano, the, the hand stone uh, used by I mean, this the, the term that, uh, that it's become known by. The handstone used by um, Native Americans um, to grind. The bottom part was a matate. The top part is a stone, and you, you grind it. This was about 1,200 years old, and, um, and of course, uh, keeps the traces of the people who sh shaped it um, with that grinding and the things that were ground in it. But the poem has become more complicated than that through um, recent tragedies in my life. Stone. In microscopic pox of a palm-sized basalt stone, traces of green corn, purslane, snake fat, and pinion fused with smeared roots and beeweed pollen, ochre dust, which drifts summer long into the scalp of a woman kneeling, intent, and bent over a light-bitten stone basin, her muscles flexed, trapezius to triceps, the wrist 
thin like yours, working a short orbital swipe, hand stone taking the curve of palm cupped, and her torso's weight falling through while swallows dive and veer along the sheer cliff, the warm scabbed heel of her palm bears down, heel of palm, into and onto the skirling sound, stone merged with the hand that grinds it wheel-wise, the maker breath blown, alive in her tool, lithe. Flies fuss and land, her hair falls across her eyes, radiant up your eye, hair, across your eyes, radiant, upbeat, leaf trilled, and into this cadence is inset the slower cadence to which she rocks her baby when he cries, as you with our son, and all the variable tempos of her breath, her body's measure, countless, breaths, decibels of fullness, day's utterance and stress, all this pressed against basalt, vesicles into the stone, into the pocked stone, goes a rabbit hair brushed from the hand that flinched the hide in late eye-long afternoon when red ants pour from holes in rocky soil, ticking across fluff grass, square-headed ants, toward a garden where three turkeys peck the leaf-eating ants, and so the garden greens up, a minor victory that registers in the eyes. The eyes purring through her eyes are your eyes, of the woman who scuffs stone on stone in the flood-buckling blare of violence and time that pockets her light in my our light, as my pupil narrows in its lens and I bend, Lord, I kneel at your stone, love, to pick up and weigh this density. Hawk glide, wing spread, my hand holding what of grief impermeable to others. Millennium's gone, her hand held, who winks out as I come clear to whom. On a green hillside where someone kneels in the now, even now, beyond our still flow, looking. And I, I think I'll, I'll finish with, um, with a, few, a few of these sh short little uh, poems written uh, with some images. Um, uh, that you don't get to see. <clears throat> uh, the images are by a photographer, Canadian photographer named Michael Floman. Whispers from your lung thicket, open cuts in limbo over our furrowed sheets, my love bud again, again in trembles through this earth smoke. Fuegos fatuos, we cast double shadows in Pantone black, my salamandrine longing, stutter cut, stutter caught on your nocturnal gorges before you're subtracted from the visible escarpment, and I'm a throbbing waste heap of ghost. My lavarotary isomers going optically active, erotic, sweeping across pelagic intimations, your apprising glance, entwined stalks, we swale against the wall, my fingers nest in your hollow, a flotsam of hieroglyphics in tadpole murk. Lupine surrounds us at the siltation zone, while lightning explosions delineate stirring pleats of night, then the sting, I'm paralyzed, you've disappeared, only my eyes widening. The reach of neural conduct nears threshold momentums in your breath, our pooled smolder, unsodden bloom, inversion puddle, just our wet flesh saves us from the scorch of annunciation. Your impact marks throng the resin of my mind, declension, a focal spasm, when your eyes release their tension, 
nocturnal pods, invertebrate and membranous surge into my dreams. From afar, do you see me now, briefly here, in this phantasmic standoff, riding pain's world forms? And I think that's, maybe there's time for one little happy poem by somebody else. <laughs> um, I'll finish with a, a poem by a Mexican poet named Alfonso de Quino. It's, uh, it was a fun translation project because it's written in two columns and it can be read down or across, and it works both ways in Spanish. <clears throat> doesn't work either way in English. <laughs> um, so I'll read you a, a couple stanzas in Spanish, just going down the left side, and then I'll read the English cross, crossways all, all the way across. Fronda, Alfonso de Quino. No tiene ninguna forma la hoja en medio de las hojas. Las hojas no son el aire, sino el aire que lo copa. Y una copa cabe en otra dentro de una sola hoja. Movimiento de la fronda que desvela otra rosa. Frond. It's formless. From within the leaves I see, the leaf in the middle, one brushing another of the leaves that keeps it company. Leaves aren't the alder, all the tree a leaf, but the air that holds all the alder in its sleeve and more leaves. And trees drink each other in, and a frond emerges from one of them, tangled in the branches, a singular leaf among the leaves. Gesticulation of the frond, from within its patterns I see disclosing in the shadowed bower another flower, the other flower. And each moves into the other, and the phylum, phylum transflorescences, like a sky invisibly woven and between two leaves opening out. Wild, invisible branch, the stalk and the corolla twisting, spirals darkening into one form and digging in. If one leaf and another leaf from the unseen branch, always are to the shade of this leaf, the same leaf, falling broken. Thank you. <laughs>